welcome to another installment of the Evolution Exchange podcast. Today I'm joined by Mika, the CEO of Metacore. Mika, it's a pleasure to have you, so thank you very much for sitting down with us. So we're going to talk about a couple of things uh, today, a little bit about your, your early career, about Metacore at the moment, and then you know a couple of challenges and things you've faced, and then the future as well of, of you know what Metacore's got in store for it as well. So let's kick off then, you know, your journey getting into the gaming industry. Give us a little bit of background on yourself. Yes. So first of all, uh, happy to be here. Uh, great to have this chat. So uh, I have been working in games for uh, almost 30 years by now. It, it feels crazy to be even saying this out loud. But I started in 96. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm working for a company called Remedy Entertainment. Uh, so working on AAA games, PC console games. I'm really typical or even serious typical person to be working in games myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a, as a, especially of my age. So <clears throat> as a, a young boy in early 80s, uh, I discovered games. And uh, then over the years, I formed this uh, naive child stream of uh, making games yeah. when I grow up. And uh, back then, there actually weren't mm. that many disciplines in making games. They were basically artists and programmers. Yeah. And I was a really bad artist, so I became a programmer. And uh, that's that's my background, basically. And uh, while um, I started, when I was uh, studying at Remedy, I was, I was still a young adult. Mm -hmm. uh, I had... Uh, really high view on my skills, mm -hmm. technical skill sets. I thought that I'm ready ready to be making games. I realized I'm not. <laughs> and uh, that's that's how I, I, I got started off uh, uh, in different area mm -hmm. of games, yeah. uh, the mobile games and casual games. And that's what defined uh, like uh, what I was to do after that, a lot of that. Um, you were working with Nokia were you on around that? Nokia as well. So Nokia uh, played a big role in in kicking off the yeah. well, I would say the whole mobile game system yeah, yeah. Uh, in the early days. So those were the Java games. Games were not free to play yet. Yeah. Uh, and of course, of course, uh, uh, us being part of the the the, the Finnish society, yeah. Finnish gaming industry. Yeah. Uh, Nokia helped us immensely yeah. in, in uh, getting a foothold uh, for games. I speak to a lot of people around Helsinki and they sort of explain that maybe Helsinki is the, the mobile hub at the moment and it's probably off the back of Nokia being quite instrumental in a lot of sure. So for a long time, like like I said, I started working uh, in, in AAA games yeah. Yeah. and uh, we felt bad about being a bit late into the industry, into that industry, like Sweden yeah. uh, was ahead of us. Yeah. But then actually, I think it was a lucky accident for us Finns, because then we caught the mobile wave. Yeah. And uh, in Sweden, the, uh, the games companies had plenty to do with the AAA. Yeah. And I think they missed uh, the mo mobile wave to an extent. There are great companies coming, uh, mobile games companies coming from Sweden as well. Yeah. But I would say that Helsinki is the, the uh, yeah, yeah. mobile gaming capital. Sort of filled that void that was left there, you know, Stockholm taking the AAA in console. So, yeah, it was there to, there to be taken. And how did that lead you on to Metacore then? So talk us through like the early days of Metacore and how that sort of come about. Yeah, so maybe actually I have to start a bit bit further away. So at Remedy, uh, we were making AAA games, and um, uh, I thought that's that's the area where I want to be working yeah. in. Uh, I thought I have technical skills to do that. I realized I have not, and uh, through a couple of lucky accidents, I ended up making mobile games. Okay. And of course, mobile games were a lot smaller games than they are nowadays, mm -hmm. and it meant that we got to develop many small games. So I really got to uh, practice the technical skill set of making games. Mm -hmm. But then I also also discovered these. Uh, uh, wider audiences, casual audiences, uh, and it made me realize that, uh, like, uh, if we look at the AAA audience, I'm part of that. I was part of that. Yeah. Nowadays, I don't have that much time to play AAA games, but but uh, uh, I'm definitely part of that audience still. Uh, that is sort of a niche audience in a way, not in a negative sense, but it really is a selected audience. There are people who understand the difference between Xbox and PlayStation and Switch. Yeah. Most likely understand the advantages and the disadvantages of gaming PC. Mm -hmm. uh, they are really well educated about, about games. Most likely playing games is an imp important hobby yeah. for these people. And there's nothing wrong about this, yeah. but it just makes this audience really a special one. Yeah. But then there are people who spend, they might spend hours per day playing games, but they don't consider themselves as gamers or players. Yeah, yeah. And they might not even say that they are playing games. And uh, it's a, it, it sounds silly and it sounds dumb at the moment, but it was a realization for me because I I was puzzled at first, yeah. somewhat puzzled, but then I enjoy watching TV series, I enjoy watching movies, but mm -hmm. I'm not a movie buff. I yeah. consume them as entertainment. And there were these people consuming games as entertainment. Yeah. And uh, I felt that's natural. That's how things should be. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt that my calling is to be making games for these kinds of audiences. And that's the path that I've been uh, uh, since. Uh, coming to Metacore, I have also, uh, so I started out in in, uh, in uh, AAA games, 
I'm also really entrepreneurial mm -hmm. uh, by mindset, and yeah. and uh, I really I mean I'm 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 tech geek. I'm into new tech. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever there's new platforms, uh, new tech, I get really excited about yeah. that. And uh, the combination of these can be actually quite uh, uh, dangerous, even. Yeah. So being being an overly optimistic uh, entrepreneur, looking after, getting exci excited about new platforms, mm -hmm. and that's what I've been been oftentimes doing. Uh, games for new new platforms. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, at uh, the, the story of Metacore actually starts uh, uh, from uh, 2014, mm -hmm. and back then the company was not called Metacore; mm -hmm. it was called Everywhere Games. Yes. Uh, Apple had just announced their first uh, uh, Apple Watch mm -hmm. uh, in the fall of 2014, and me and my co-founder Aki Arvilehto, uh, we were discussing what kind of games yeah. you have to be building for smartwatches. So the, oh. the, uh, the idea being that whenever a new platform is being born, games are one of the first killer apps on that mm -hmm. platform. Yeah. Uh, we got so excited about the idea of building games for these really the tiny screens yeah. that uh, we decided to found a company uh, based on this premise. Long story short, uh, uh, we uh, within the next uh, three years' time, mm -hmm. we launched four games, three of those Apple chose as game of the year uh, for Apple Watch, and we were the most successful and best smartwatch game developer out Fantastic. there, I would say. But it, it says more about the market than about us. Yeah, so we didn't really have competition. Was that just you two, or was there more people? No, we involved? we had a, we had a small team, about uh, ten people, okay. uh, working on these games. Yeah, and um, so yeah, so it, uh, in in two thousand eighteen, uh, we were doing uh, some soul searching as a company. So mm -hmm. where do we want to go? Do we stay focused uh, on smartwatches, mm -hmm. or do we do a pivot to some other mm -hmm. other area? And uh, uh, I was I was personally really fr really frustrated yeah. because I was I found myself in a situation that I had been many times before, yeah. getting excited about something, being overly optimistic, and then seeing that things didn't pan out as as I hoped for yeah. uh, them to do. And uh, so then uh, uh, so the the options indeed were that uh, we would stay focused on smartwatches, wait for the industry to, to mature, and then be yeah. the best one, remain the best one. Yeah. Uh, uh, but then, uh, looking at the the smartwatch industry, looking at how other other areas uh, uh, develop, uh, our thinking back then was that it will take at least five years mm. for the industry to mature to a stage where you can build scalable businesses yeah. uh, on, on on top of. And uh, if you look, so this was 2018. Mm -hmm. So that should have been last year. It didn't happen. So no. that's that's like, a, and I thought five years is most likely quite realistic time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Five years is quite long time. It didn't happen. So. Uh, but then uh, looking at the option of pivoting, so where, where would we pivot to? Mm -hmm. And of course, mobile games were already back then huge industry. Yeah. And uh, that was obviously where the opportunities were. At the same time, uh, the talk on the streets was that uh, mobile games is so competitive space that yeah. you shouldn't go find a startup in this space. Yeah. And it intuitively, it made sense. So like if you look at the biggest uh, mobile games companies back in the day, uh, they were already investing 100 plus million euros yeah. into marketing on an annual basis. Yeah. You as a startup, if you're able to raise 20 million, even 50 million, how are you able to compete with these other companies? Uh, uh, so, and and also considering how the the, the industry is hit driven. Yeah. So the odds really seem to be against uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, startups. But then we realized that we have heard this many times before, like. Whenever we have been talking about uh, uh, mobile games, uh, it's been really competitive. Yeah. Already uh, dating back to the uh, like uh, before uh, free to play in mobile. So, for example, I don't know how many remember, but when Supercell was founded, uh, the founders had experience in making mobile games, but they decided to found uh, a company focusing on browser games mm. because mobile was seen as so, was seen as so competitive yeah. that there's no space for startups. Uh, of course, shift to free to play changed this, but then. After the shift to free-to-play, they had been. Uh, there were multiple occasions when, for example, when uh, Supercell broke through and the other uh, King and other big yeah. companies broke through. Uh, there was a period of time when, uh, if you looked at the top crossing charts, they were static. Basically. Yeah. The games were in the in the same positions, and then uh, we were we were saying how these companies they had perfect timing, uh, but now they have a lockup on the industry, mm -hmm. so they are able to reap a huge profits from the industry. And then they're able to invest all that back into making games. Mm -hmm. So there's no space for others. Yeah. No room for others. Now it feels even dumb to be saying that those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. We know the dynamics of the industry, but that was a repeating thing. So then uh, in 2018, we were discussing like, all right, it makes sense. Yeah. Intuitively, it makes sense. It's so competitive, but is it really? Yeah. And the first realization was that if we look at free to play, 
it basically was uh, kicked off uh, in Western markets 2012. Mm -hmm. In 2018, that was six years mm -hmm. ago, yeah. like six years. Uh, can it really be that uh, within six years, the industry develops to a stage where, where there's uh, no room for startups, mm -hmm. no room for new companies, no room for new innovations? Uh, and then uh, it, it, it felt like, well, no, it can't be. So yeah. Six years is such a short time. Do you and think that, that's like a little bit leaning towards, you mentioned earlier, your entrepreneurial mindset and your mindset of like, you know, there's, there's areas and I'm going to go and get that, even though the odds may be stacked against us and, you know, there's low the competition. I think I think sort of, yeah. But also like uh, me being an entrepreneur, I had been the kind of entrepreneur, like I said, I, I got excited about new technology. Yes. I really like, uh, uh, I really liked uh, reading about uh, these hero stories of uh, founders uh, who had used mm -hmm. disruptive innovation or blue ocean strategy to, to create something new. And and uh, that's that that was the, the the pattern that I was also trying to replicate. Yeah. But then in 2018, uh, so looking at the industry being like really competitive already back then, but then uh, uh, like uh, questioning whether the, that really is means that it's a mature industry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we made the realization that looking at different like there are different proxies you can look at the industry from through, uh, like looking at the industry. Our conclusion was that that yeah for sure there is competition. But the industry is immature. Mm. We are really young as yeah. an industry. If we are young as an industry, it means that there will be a lot of changes yeah. uh, in, in the future. All these changes are opportunities for the smart companies. But then, like, if the industry is immature, does it make sense to use disruptive innovation of blue ocean to yeah. attack it? Yeah. Sometimes there's this, like, this term about the blue ocean versus red ocean. Sometimes actually it makes sense to jump into the red ocean and mm -hmm. compete. Yeah. If the industry is immature, actually it might be the best strategy. Mm -hmm. I had been avoiding competition the whole of my life. Yeah. But then I, I like uh, I realized that. So I'm passionate about games. I was basically born into the industry. I have been passionate. I am passionate. Uh, I have been working in, in games for the whole of my life. Yeah. Shouldn't I have the skills to compete yeah, in this yeah. industry? And then why like? Why had I been avoiding competition? Mm -hmm. And then I realized that actually, yeah, I should be jumping into the red ocean to compete. Yeah, that's the right way way to, to do things. So yeah, as an entrepreneur, I definitely had the the like uh, wrong recipe uh, before. And then I realized that actually I should just jump in and, and compete. And it took so long time for me to to get this. I I, I still feel ashamed <laughs> about yeah. that. But indeed, that's how Metacore got founded. Yeah, but there's probably people like yourself that decide not to jump into that and then we'll never make that leap and yes. there'll probably be companies that you know could have been fantastic and amazing but have never come to fruition because people don't decide to take that that leap and i imagine once you've done that and metaphor has been founded and obviously you know fantastic company now very successful there must have been a, an abundance of challenges along the way from getting from that point from founding up until where you are now so is there any particular, like the early days, at, like where you were scaling the company, like talk us through some of the challenges that you might have faced at the time? I think that there's been like, uh, uh, there haven't been any, any big major challenges, but there's been a string of uh, smaller challenges and a lot of learnings mm -hmm. uh, to be had. I think so when, when we when we decided to pivot into mobile games, of course, then we had to decide what kind of company do we want to be yeah. and uh, what, what do we focus on? And those were the first kind of uh, challenges or decision points. And uh, looking at the uh, like uh, looking at the industry, uh, there are some things that we, we saw clearly. For example, the way games were made, and especially I, I know this by heart because I have been making games in that way. In the old days, uh, oftentimes games were, were were made so that uh, we as a game team we sat down and then we discussed and decided what kind of game do we want to be making. Yeah. And this was especially in the times of uh, AAA games. We were making games for our kinds of audiences. Mm -hmm. Knowingly or unknowingly, unknowingly. Uh, and uh, I think when you're doing it knowingly, there's nothing wrong about that. But yeah. but doing unknowingly things uh, that's, that that might be might be dangerous. You might get lucky, but but otherwise it's it's dangerous place to be in. So uh, we 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 realized that uh, uh, oftentimes we have done decisions unknowingly. Mm. So then if uh, it's not the smartest way to be making games based on what you feel yeah. like, like what is well audience. Yeah. Looking at more mature industries, audiences, you start from the audience. Yeah. Uh, whom are you serving uh, with, with your products, with your games? So as, as, uh, as silly and dumb uh, uh, as it sounds, so we decided to start from the audience. Mm -hmm. We are making games for audiences. Yeah. 
in my experience, whenever I've been working on a game that has reached a certain level of success, no matter how passionate I'm about the game, mm-hmm. there are always players who are more passionate about the game yeah. than I am. They understand the game better than I do, or anyone in the game team. Yeah. And that's a really, really humbling experience. Mm. They they feel that this game is, is is for me, and they really understand the game better. And uh, so that's that's what, what we decided to take as, as one of the pillars. So mm-hmm. we are making games for players, players yeah. for audiences. Uh, then uh, looking at the, uh, the kind of company, so looking at games as an industry mm-hmm. and the, the kind of company that we want to be building, our idea from the beginning was that we want to build a company that is made to last. Mm. Uh, so what does it mean? What does it consist of? Uh, culture was one of the pillars that we decided to focus on on there. And uh, there, I have to, again, go go back to, to, to my culture journey. So uh, when I, like almost 20 years ago, uh, I have sort of like, I have felt the importance of culture, mm-hmm. uh, basically the, the, the whole of my life. And uh, for example, at Remedy, uh, mm-hmm. it was a group of passionate people. We didn't talk about culture, but there was strong culture. Yeah. It was born out of the, the people. Yeah. It was not defined, but it was just born. Uh, uh, about 20 years ago, I had an opportunity to work for a company where culture was seen as an, as an important thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, in that company, uh, we wanted to define the culture, uh, uh, verbalize the culture. And uh, we did it. It was really a traditional way to do it back then, that we did it by defining key words. Mm-hmm. Uh, the words oftentimes, were, they were inspirational yeah. and aspirational uh, as well. So they could be like uh, excellence or innovation or yeah. ownership and, and such. And uh, back then I felt intuitively, again, it made sense. Yeah. But then seeing it in practice, I, I, say, I saw that it doesn't work out really. Like, oh, right. uh, like, like a word, for example, innovation. Yeah. When I say a word like innovation, you have a different idea of that than me most yeah. likely if we have five people we have five different definition definitions mm-hmm. of innovation so it's not it's not enough yet and even though i thought that this this intuitively this makes sense i sort of like lost hope uh, mm-hmm. about about defining culture in this way then i thought that it just it, it is born okay but then uh, uh 2009 uh the netflix culture deck started spreading in the in the internet yeah. and uh, i also of course read it and uh, i was really inspired by that uh, it was a really different take on culture. Mm-hmm. It was, first of all, the deck was long mm-hmm. and it was really verbose, mm-hmm. uh, but it was also inspirational. Yeah. I felt inspired. I got excited uh, about reading that. I didn't feel like it would be the kind of culture I would want to be working in, but mm-hmm. I was really inspired. And I thought this is definitely a better way of defining culture. And then there have been a, a number of other examples after that. There was uh, the Valve uh, Handbook for New Employees uh, that I read uh, 2014. Mm. And again, I was really inspired. It was exciting. It, it sounded like really interesting in the place. Again, uh, it, it felt too chaotic for me personally. But again, I felt inspired. It's more like the processes as how these other people are creating their culture in their company. Exactly. What you're interested in. Yes. But then, then and then there were there uh, there were like uh, these culture memos and culture handbooks from other companies, and and uh, uh, we started to see the pattern mm-hmm. of uh, this is actually how how the culture should be defined. So when when we decided to pivot. Uh, Metacore, we decided that culture is, is it's a really important thing yeah. for us, and this is how we want to to be uh, uh, defining it as well. Mm-hmm. So then uh, uh, we did define the culture. We wrote our own uh, culture memo nice. uh, uh, to begin with. Uh, it was uh, six pages yeah. long back back in the day, and uh, it was uh, uh, it still uh, exists. People, I actually encourage people to read it because there you can see how much we have learned. Yeah, that culture memo was really uh, aspirational. In many many ways, it was really uh, naive, even. Yeah, and you can see, like, if you read that culture memo uh, and our cu- current culture agreement, you can see the, the the delta. You can see many kinds of challenges that we have had to tackle. Yeah, uh, along the way. So Does that come mostly from like the size of the company changing, so culture changes with that, or is there any other particular like so, elements of culture change along the journey of? you know, scale in the company. Yeah, I, I, well, like, uh, of course, uh, uh, the amount of people, that might be the, the, the biggest factor yeah. in there. But also, like, one thing, especially as a smaller team, it's just experience. Mm. Like, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, like, one of the challenges we have to tackle, oftentimes, these challenges actually are such that uh, it's about, uh, in a way, uh, uh, internal challenge, in a way, to, to yourself. Yeah. So you believe in something, and then... Uh, uh, if that belief is not right, first of all, like how are you able to come to a point where you can question that mm. belief? 
one one such thing uh, for us was that uh, uh, when we defined our culture the first time, we were talking about small independent teams. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, uh, uh, like uh, small independent th teams were the thing. That, that was the way way to make games. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, we were really hugely. Uh, we were admiring Supercell, and we were inspired by that. And they were talking about small independent teams, and uh, that was a thing we picked from them. We yeah. wanted to also have small independent teams. It felt nice. It felt cozy. Yeah. Uh, having a small driven team to be be working on these games, uh, and uh, it took us a long time to understand that actually it doesn't work for us. We we can't operate in this way, uh, and uh, we were banging our head to 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 the wall. Uh, and then we decided that we just have to like we we can't have small independent teams. Yeah. We we have to like uh, start scaling the teams, have bigger teams, uh, and uh, that led us to the realization that well, small independent teams, small doesn't hold. Yeah, it can't be small. Uh, but then we started questioning like independent. What does independent even mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that led us to develop the culture overall. Like it, independent became autonomy. So we actually mean autonomy by that, yeah. uh, and uh, and all of that. So it's it's interesting. It's been interesting to see, uh, like, uh, uh, through through culture, uh, the things that we have learned, mm -hmm. uh, and now we have experience on. So of course that, that so that's that's one thing. But then of course also people, just the yeah. amount of people, uh, organizing the work. How do you how do you make sure that uh, everybody uh, has clarity on what what is priority to begin with? Yeah. So there, there's there's a huge number of challenges that you have to tackle. Yeah, well, you must be doing something right because uh, as I said to you before, we speak to a lot of people in the industry and in, in Helsinki especially, and a lot of people are saying Metacore's like the place to be at the moment and are really hearing positive things, but not only about the game and the company, but the culture side of it as well. So it's obviously quite felt very strongly across people in the company to, you know, the industry is quite small, so word travels and uh, it's really good to hear that. And you mentioned before about you know, jumping in the red side of the sea and being very competitive. And now um, the industry, there's a lot of gaming companies in Helsinki as well. How do you stay competitive in this sort of market then at the moment? Are there any particular strategies or anything that you, you do slightly differently? Well, I think uh, I think it's, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think going back to, to me saying that the, the industry is immature, mm -hmm. uh, I think that gives uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, like uh, context for how we see things. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that like to stay competitive, first of all, it's about people, like who are the people within Metacore? Uh, and uh, then what is the environment uh, where we can enable these people to do their best work and be inspired and be excited about, about these things? Uh, I think that's the, the first and foremost, that's the most important thing. But then also like, what does it mean when we say that the market is in, immature? Mm -hmm. I think in many ways it means that uh, we shouldn't be looking too much inside, mm -hmm. but we should be drawing inspiration from outside yeah. the industry as well. And uh, that's what we have been doing. Like, uh, in a way, uh, it's easy to be in your own bubble and then take things for granted. Mm -hmm. But then when, when you're able to see, like, look at things from outside, there are some things oftentimes that look actually obvious yeah. uh, uh, from that perspective. But they, they were not obvious when you were in your own, own bubble. I think one, one thing is, uh, one example is, uh, is uh, uh, the role of uh, IP and marketing mm. in the industry. If we uh, look at the industries where products are commodities, so then companies usually don't compete with uh, uh, the uh, uh, like uh, details of the product and mm. features, uh, but but uh, companies oftentimes focus on positioning and, and building brands. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think think of uh, uh, fast moving consumer goods, for example, shampoo, uh, so yeah. it, it is about IP and brands. If you look at the role of brands in games, there are some companies who, who focus on that, who, who invest into in the building brands, but actually not too many. Mm -hmm. So when then the question is, when we uh, move towards maturity, does the role of brand and IP increase? Our argument is that yes, yeah, uh, it, it does. Uh, so this is the way to, to look at the, the industry mm -hmm. and, and draw inspiration from, and also not only to in a way stay competitive, yeah, but be uh, spearheading where we are heading as an industry. Yeah, and um, you obviously Merge Mansions is a really successful game at the moment. So, how do you face challenges of keeping, you know, keeping that a competitive game, keeping that to be successful, but at the same time looking ahead as to as well as to you know what's next, what what other games have we got in the the pipeline and things like that. So, like managing them two aspects of the the business. 
I think it's, again, great question. And uh, uh, so I think when it comes to to uh, merge management, so one of the things that has been a really, really big challenge for us, uh, uh, when we launched merge management, we were a team of about 15 people. Mm -hmm. Now we are 250. Yeah. So in the past four years time, we have grown from 15 to, to 250. And that already like finding the people, finding the talent, uh, make the kind of environment where, where this uh, talent can thrive, uh, knowing what to do, organizing work in a scaling team. Mm -hmm. That's that's really, really hard. It's super, super hard. Uh, it takes uh, really smart people to to be tackling these, yeah. these challenges. Uh, and uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. So how, how have you managed to keep the game successful as it is now but also balance that with looking at, yes, ex at other, exactly. other projects yeah so so the, the first thing is uh like uh uh just the sheer amount of content we need mm -hmm. for the game so we need a bigger team to be able to produce more content mm -hmm. we are scaling the team we are putting in processes uh, all of that and so far we have been successful but we are still short on talent we yeah. still need more talented people then of course also knowing what to do like learning on the way on the go like uh, what are the, the activations that mm -hmm. uh, players want? What what is the way uh, that uh, we we create engaging content? Yeah. Uh, all of that. It it is super super hard. Then when it comes to new games, so if we look at the merge mansion and and uh, uh, like uh, uh, new games or early stage games, I think this is one of the interesting things in the in the industry overall. If we look at uh, the whole like uh, game life cycle or product life cycle, uh, in the end, like merge mansion. Uh, it's an operation of about like uh, close to 200 people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a live game. Uh, there's constant uh, uh, development of, of new content yeah. and all that. But the way we started was it was really really small team, team of less than 10 people. And this is how we believe that actually things should be done. So in, in the early stage, you have to have a small team, yeah. as small team as possible. Uh, and then when you find market fit, you have to scale the deals up, yeah. to, up to like uh, hundreds of people uh, a team. And uh, that, that, that's that's how we are we are like a, uh, that's how we see things and that's the kind of environment that we are trying to create. So it's actually two like they are two separate, completely separate yeah. entities even. Yeah. So in new games, it's uh, like one kind of environment and and one kind of like lifeblood in there. Merge mansion is is whole different. How much um, you know in the when you were going from fifty to two hundred in, in merge mansions and you were scaling that very quickly, how much like in the back of your mind is oh this is going amazing. But we, when do we start thinking about new stuff? You know, like when are you 100% focused on merge mansions, and at what point do you start to go, well, let's start having to think about new things? Yeah, it's 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 excellent question, and that's been in the back of my head actually all the time. Yeah. So I'll, as I said, we want to create a company that is built to last. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it means that uh, as we are working on games, we need to build a portfolio of games. Mm -hmm. Merge mansion being the first first game in that portfolio, but then we need more. Uh, at the same time, understanding that uh, we need more talent in the team, in merge mansion team, mm. like how, how do we balance balance this out, and how do we ensure focus for people? Uh, I don't think that there's uh, one right answer to this. Uh, we probably could have done things uh, more optimally uh, in the end, but but then I, I think there's there's no shortcuts in there. You yeah. have to go and try try out, and also at the same time, like. Like I said about the the small independent teams, we thought that we can keep the, the team size a lot smaller. This actually, so one advice. These are the things about uh, I mentioned that sometimes it's like sometimes the blocker can be yourself mm. and your beliefs, mm. and uh, you have to be able to in a, in a healthy way question these beliefs every now and then. And one of these like really practical things for me has been the the small independent team. I was uh, I got a tip. I think it was about four years ago. Uh, when talking about merge management, I got a tip that uh, that hey, that's that's a really content heavy game. Mm -hmm. That uh, you, you you know what what you're getting into, and and we were like I said, we were a team of like less than fifteen people, mm -hmm. and I said that yeah yeah sure I understand this is content heavy, but we have the the like uh, in merge games there's uh, exponential economy and all that, so we have all of that. We are fine. Yeah, we know what we are getting into. Uh, then a year from that, I realized that actually I didn't know what we were getting into. This is really, really content heavy game. Yeah. And I thought that like how come I didn't listen to that advice better? But then a year ahead, I realized that actually I still didn't really get it. Yeah. Year ahead, still didn't get it. So like like uh, it's really like a 
again, I, I don't believe that there are shortcuts in, in this, but you can accelerate the process of understanding. Yeah. So I think now, if I would go back, discuss with the person uh, with, with, with whom I discussed four years ago, who said that it's really content heavy. Now I could say that now I understand <laughs> that what you were saying a bit better. Yeah. Uh, but it's taken me four years. But yeah, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And everybody can go back and go, yeah. But does that then affect your the way you receive advice now from maybe other people as well about the future, you know, of looking five years on and like your style of either, you know, thinking about, okay, what's that going to look like? And anybody else giving you advice? Has that changed because of these past experiences? I think for sure. So like I said, uh, when, when I got into the industry as an uh, like young adult, I was most likely like really annoying, arrogant. Yeah guy <laughs> who thought I know everything and I, I, I have all the skill sets and and I've, I've gotten enough scars by now yeah. to know that actually painful uh, painful experience is that actually I have been wrong so many times yeah and I most likely will be wrong many times in the future as well mm -hmm. so best to to pay attention to that yeah I, I think it's it's really about uh, being aware of this and and uh, of course you shouldn't overthink things yeah you have to keep on moving forward yeah but being able to uh, question things in a healthy way every now and then yeah. i think that's that's a good practice and i just want to touch on from the recruitment perspective i'm really interested in from going from 50 to then like 200 on, on one game you say it's very content driven so you obviously need all these people but that's still a a huge challenge to get from you know a to b there and also having the right people because you could get anybody and really yeah. but you know that doesn't ultimately mean it's going to be successful and go back to what you said about like keeping the core value of culture within that the whole time as well how did you manage to do that? Like, talk us for a little bit of like the recruitment strategy there. So we have been lucky many, many times over, and uh, there have been many occasions when, when uh, we have felt that uh, this is how we should be doing, uh, uh, and uh, then later on realized that actually this was exactly what we what we were supposed to be doing. We did it without better knowledge. Now we understand it better, but but luckily we we did that. Uh, culture is one such thing. That culture is is the the uh, basis that we are building the company mm -hmm. on top of. But one of the lucky accidents in early days of uh, Metacore was that uh, uh, I uh, I was uh, speaking with the uh, uh, various people from Supercell, mm. and then then I started paying attention to how many uh, internal recruiters they had. Yeah, and uh, there were so many. I started counting, like mm -hmm. because I felt that there's something doesn't really click, and uh, then uh, I ended up, uh, if I remember correctly, about 5% of uh, the headcount of Supercell were internal recruiters. Really? And I was puzzled. I was wondering, like, if Supercell has this many internal recruiters, yeah. like, how, how come? And back then, I was still living in the in the mindset of, like, when talking about entrepreneurs and founders, mm -hmm. you have to do recruiting. Yeah. Like, you have to be really great at that. You have to be able to sell your vision to, to people and and be able to find the, the best, best people and, yeah. and, and so forth. And uh, I had done like my fair share of uh, recruiting. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that actually maybe I don't know that much about this yeah. in the end after all, that there's there's something here. And uh, I back then I just like kind of like made a mental note that remember this. And then when it came time for us to start scaling the company, uh, I remember this. So then I thought that actually I might not know that much about recruiting. Mm -hmm. So we have to find someone who knows. Yeah. And uh, we, were, we were looking for a uh, people lead back in the day, and we wanted to find someone who understands recruiting. Mm -hmm. and, and we found one. She's now our COO. And uh, that was one really big lucky accident for us mm -hmm. because she knew recruiting. She knew what it takes. And she started building a talent acquisition team for us. Mm -hmm. And now I know a lot more about recruiting yeah. because of her and because of our talent acquisition team. So I would say that, that uh, the way we invested in the talent acquisition early on that's paid off immensely. Yeah. Uh, so it's about culture, it's about talent acquisition, and these go many times hand in hand. Well, you say it's an accident, but I think that's come from you spotting, like you're looking at Supertel and noticing, well, they've got them, like, what can we do? And then you end up finding the people, like you mentioned, the person who's now COO to then lead that strategy. So the, that vision's still there, and like the, the entrepreneurial side of you, I think, is coming out there as well. Um, and you going from that number to, like we said, a larger number now and, and where the company is, I imagine it's the largest company that you've been like leading as well. How has your leadership style changed with that? Is there a point where you go, oh, like, I'm leading quite a few people here now and you need to sort of develop your own style and your own managerial sort of presence as well? 
excellent question and and uh, yeah I, I i bet it's it's been changing in many ways and uh, again like uh, true experience for, uh, uh, first and foremost i think uh, i think it, it it begins from uh, like i'm a programmer mm -hmm. i've been making games myself uh, like i know that craft in, inside out and i know what it takes for me to be inspired and creative and efficient mm. and then i understand that people are different mm. so we have to we have to uh, because this is creative work uh, we have to understand how to make the context for creating the work to begin with and i believe that my experience in in making games actually helped me help yeah. helped me a lot uh, in in that and being part of the team because then i see that we actually indeed are different the thing that works for me doesn't work for for someone else mm. The other thing is uh, like looking at the industry uh, at large and then also like comparing to other industries, like what are things that make this industry unique? Mm. People in the games industry, oftentimes they are like me, they are passionate about games. They are passionate about their craft. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, like uh, motivational problems are usually not one of the these leadership challenges. Mm -hmm. It's actually the opposite. People oftentimes overwork. There's mm. a lot of talk about uh, uh, bad uh, work-life balance in the industry and my belief is there are some companies that uh, take advantage of people mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, uh, they they do things that that uh, they shouldn't be doing but then also oftentimes the companies don't set clear boundaries mm -hmm. for people and and i think that's what we should be we should be caring for people yeah people are really passionate they're really driven they want to excel they want to do great things they 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 want to be inspired and they want to be in the flow state yeah and we have to draw clear boundaries yeah. for that work setting and what is the the uh work-life balance uh, in the end uh and and like things like culture for example and I, I i thought about my culture journey and learnings there now i know culture is super super important yeah. uh and i've learned by doing so there's been this this uh like the concept of culture has been changing and again, one of the lucky accidents for us was that, first of all, we saw what good looks like in the Netflix culture uh, deck and um, Valve culture deck mm -hmm. and from other companies. And we were able to draw inspiration from there and conclude uh, what kind of company we want to be building. Mm. But then when we did our first uh, culture memo, we realized that this is, uh, well, we realized shortly afterwards uh, through experience that in our culture memo, there were many things that were really aspirational that we actually didn't know that much about. Now we know better, like small independent teams. Yeah. We know that we can't have small teams. So then we realized that uh, that uh, the environment is changing and we are changing. So culture should be changing as well. Mm -hmm. And not only changing haphazardly, but we actually should be developing the culture yeah. uh, proactively. We should be developing with the people mm -hmm. because we have more and more people. We we can't account for everything when we are a smaller team, yeah. but then when we are a bigger one, we, we should be. So so that's that's um, like one of the things uh, that highlights the importance of culture. Yeah. And these have come through to experience. Then one of the, the like uh, later later experiences uh, learnings has been about uh, the amount of people. Like what does this amount of people? What do we need to have in place? Mm -hmm that everybody has clarity on what we are working on and clarity brings happiness yeah. well-being and all of that and it, it again it doesn't happen automatically we have to do see effort yeah. to, to do all of that to do all of that so i think it, it really is about like uh, keeping your eyes open uh your ears ears open yeah and and seeing like what, what are the, the friction points and what are the things that we need to be tackling and i, I think we just have to stay humble and also <laughs> accept the mistakes yeah. oftentimes we learn through mistakes so yeah. make as small mistakes as possible to then learn from and looking ahead to the future you, you know you said you want to build a company to last we spoke a little bit about you know new projects and where the thinking comes from there you currently you've got a new berlin studio a new cto as well so you there's quite a lot of new advancements happening this year for you for you guys so what are your thoughts on the future like what does metaco look like in sort of five to ten years time it's an excellent question, and and that's again, like I said, it's, uh, it's a shifting thing. So the, the goal goal is uh, to build a portfolio of games. Mm -hmm. So it, it all starts from there. What do we need to be achieving that? Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, there are there are many aspects to, aspects to this. Uh, like just to to give some some practical examples. Uh, one is uh, you mentioned CTO tech. I have tech background. Yeah. Uh, I. Uh, I have been many times in situations where we 
uh, like uh, over invest in tech mm -hmm. uh, and then when we over invest in tech the product doesn't work in the end after all so that's that's wasted effort mm. and uh, i've come from uh, like really uh, over investing to tech myself leaning towards we have to find something that works first and then we'll figure out the rest uh, and it's it's like in kind of like this pendulum that i have i have been been on yeah and realizing that that uh, we actually have to invest quite a bit into tech mm -hmm. in the end to be able to build the portfolio of of uh, uh, games and not only into the tech that that we used to make games but also into the tooling that we run uh, games as services and such and uh, the the cto uh, uh, is like uh, spot on in, yeah. in filling in this this role and this function but but there are these things that again i think i'm i'm coming back to like uh, uh, understanding your own biases, understanding like your own thinking, and then being mm -hmm. able to question that and seeing seeing that as a whole, and that's how the, the process has gone. So it, within the, within five years' time, I hope we have uh, two to three live games uh, as big as Merge Mansion. Merge Mansion is still for sure going for uh, going strong. Yeah. So Merge Mansion is now four years old. Yeah. Uh, uh, our goal is to be uh, creating games uh, that are here to stay. So like the, the lifetime is uh, at least ten plus years, mm -hmm. hopefully decades. And in Merge Mansion, I see that we we have a you first can. such yeah. game. Uh, so then having one or two more uh, in, yeah. in five years' time is is the goal. But then also uh, like really finding a way to understand the audience and create experiences for this audience mm -hmm. in uh, in a way that uh, we can do new hit games in a consistent way. Because the industry is really hit driven. But I believe that that we can improve the odds by being in a way smarter, doing things uh, yeah. uh, in a, in a smarter way than what we have done in the past. And Talk a little bit on the the expansion into Berlin as well, because that's very exciting. You know, branching out a little bit from Finland, and and how do you see that developing? Yeah. So the expansion to Berlin, uh, the most important reason for us uh, to do that was talent. Mm. So in Finland, we we are the mobile gaming capital here. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the games industry in Finland employs about four thousand people, mm. four thousand uh, four and a half thousand people. Uh, if you think that uh, for one live game, you need a team of 200, 300, 400 people, maybe. We can't fit too many uh, uh, such teams in Finland. Yeah. Uh, so, so there, there are limits. We are able to attract new talent into into Finland. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's that's a great thing. Uh, but then uh, our need for talent was higher than that, and that's why we decided to yeah. uh, to uh, expand to Berlin. In Berlin, there's a great hub for uh, game talent, mm -hmm. uh, but then there's also uh, tech and creative industries. For example, our CTO mm -hmm. uh, is is coming. Uh, yeah, exactly. He's, he's sitting in Berlin. So, so it's a great talent pool that we can tap into uh, by doing that. Uh, so, talent first and foremost. Now, we can also offer to people uh, two locations to yeah. relocate to. So, there's Helsinki and Berlin yeah. that people can choose from. Well, it'll be really exciting to see how that goes because it's fairly new, isn't it? The, this year, uh, the Berlin studio. Uh, so, last question then, uh, Mika. I'm going to ask what's your biggest piece of advice you would give to somebody who maybe was a similar position to you a couple of years ago? thinking about jumping in, starting something, you know, you're very entrepreneurial yourself. So what's the one piece of advice you could offer them? One piece of advice. This is a really tricky question. There's, <laughs> there's, there's so many things that I could be saying at the same time. I feel like I'm, I'm not the one to give advice to other people. I've been uh, wrong so many times my, myself before. I think it's, it's really about, uh, like, uh, if I think about if I would go give advice to my younger self, understanding that my younger self would be more arrogant than <laughs> I am yeah. maybe not so receptive <laughs> to the advice. Uh, but but really like uh, 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 like uh, be present and and be like pay attention to things uh, around you and and pay attention to your own biases. Mm. Like it's important that we believe. It's important that we are optimistic and we are driven and all that. But at the same time, you have to understand your biases yeah. because some of those biases, like I've given many examples, mm -hmm. they become blockers yeah. for you. And then you, you just have to overcome them. Yeah. So I think I think that's 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 maybe the, the advice I would give. That's a fantastic bit of advice for people. Mika, thank you very much for that. Thank really you. That. Thank you for the discussion. Yeah, not a problem. And we'll see you next time.